All right, guys, welcome back. I am sitting down today in Hong Kong with Alejandro. Alejandro is coming from Macau today to uh, discuss a little bit of things about the company, this art trade, trading and different things around. So, what's up, Alejandro? Welcome in Hong Kong. Hi, Etienne. How are you? It's a pretty hazy day today in Hong Kong, but it was a pretty good trip uh, coming here to visit you today. Yeah, a long, like, an hour trip. Yeah, it's not far from Macau. Yeah, it's uh, just a two-hour trip if you count the the public transports to get to the hotel. Cool. So yeah. We've got the view on here, the train, the MTR, as well as a mountain in the back, which you guys can now see, called Lion Rock. It's pretty epic, pretty nice. Uh, and a small restaurant. So we'll talk about uh, a little bit of everything. Um, I know it's like working for me now for this art trade, coding algos, doing assistance, doing that, uh, different coding project on different things, which is awesome. So I want to talk about this a little bit. I, I know people want to get into algos because they like the freedom. I think for me, it's been a way to kind of get a ton more freedom through algos. So I want you to tell people like, how do you get involved with Argos in the first place? Well, my first uh, like approach to Argos was probably 2013 or 2014 when I was passing through a course and I found out this like this tool online that was like a kind of free algo EA builder or something like that. It was pretty terrible. Uh, but basically it was, you have like some basic rules and you could basically make like a, a pretty basic moving average crossover strategy uh, with the algo thingy and just like entry open one lot and that like super, super simple stuff, super basic. And then I was like, oh, this is interesting. I could potentially uh, back test maybe some of the strategies I have found in forums. At that time I was checking maybe peeps uh, to start learning and all those things. And then I was like, oh, there are some strategies here that they say are very good. You know, you know, they always send the forum some strategies that are great, uh, great returns and that. And I was like, oh, I, I think I could maybe use this to test some of those strategies. And then I started you know, going into there and then it was more of a part-time thing. I went into it a bit, I stopped it, I went into it a bit, I stopped it. Uh, because at that time I was uh, in the first years of my university degree. So university take took like the first priority and then the algo building part was more like a second thought, like uh, something that I was doing when I didn't have much work to do at uni because uni is CC. And then I just was like, okay, I'm bored. Let's see uh, some trading algos. And eventually uh, during my master's degree, I programmed a full strategy from uh, a course that they had a strategy there. And then I programmed the full strategy. And finally I started trading it with live money. It worked perfectly during like one month and then it didn't work anymore. But it was an interesting for because I didn't do any back testing anything. I was just like testing it with live money in the live markets. Uh, but I was pretty proud that I was able to program every single step of the strategy, a really complicated strategy. And then uh, I was still using EA builders at that time. Then after that, I started to look more in the code because I wanted to do more advanced stuff. I wanted to start to tweak some stuff. And after that, now, because like all this, as I said, is on and off, so that now it's uh, 2016 now. And then Etienne was starting to work at that time uh, with uh, uh, coding his strategy, also using builders and that. And at that time, I was starting to go into more the code and that. So I started to go into that side and eventually got into the full code. And now I am doing my own strategies. I developed the training assistant uh, for the academy. And I am also right now doing uh, some other strategies that we code for clients in the side to trade. Uh, really, really interesting. And I'm really happy about the journey. It's pretty, pretty interesting journey. Yeah. I remember back in 2000, whatever, 17 or 18, where I was trying to code this strategy that I had, the Bonjour Universal. And I didn't know how to do the uh, percentages per trade, how to risk the percentage account per trade. And I tried to code it myself. It took me like uh, two, three days to be able to find how to code it. And then it didn't work. So I was like, well, okay, I'll, f I'll find a way someday to make it work. And then he reached out to me by email saying, oh, if you want to make this person of risk per trade, I can do it. It's simple. And he did it and that worked. So we just kept going after, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, and since then, we've been able to add a lot of like different things that I never thought about that are pretty useful for trading with the strategy. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah. And for me, it has been a process of well, like, like play and discovery. 
uh, what is I, something that I think many traders sometimes forget that yeah. when you are testing new things, you have to play, you have to discover, and then you have to test and see what works, what doesn't work, and how to improve it. Uh, and that is what the, the approach we took when we started working together. And I remember that I had taken around three to four months to develop that code because I was still learning of how to make the 1% risk per trade. It was just a pretty good coincidence that when he was, the team was starting to, to look for it, I had basically finished doing that and finished testing it with my own demo account. And I was able to just reach out immediately. I think it was like one week after he put out his blog, I, I sent him an email like, oh, I saw in your blog you were uh, looking at the next steps in your EA development, adding this. So it's pretty, pretty pretty interesting in terms of the timing of everything. I was just finishing doing that and he was just starting. And so we connected like that. I feel like for a lot of people, coding their own thing is not the ideal thing to do because it takes time, takes energy, takes like you're gonna find, you're gonna come across problems and challenges. So coding everything for you by yourself might, might not be the answer. At least for me, I feel like I'm not the best at it. So I'm not gonna code everything myself. But for people wanting to start with Argo, what would you recommend them to do or think about? I have this philosophy, as I told you, of experimenting. So the first thing I would recommend anyone that wants to start with Algos is if you have a background in engineering, mathematics, or anything like that, that helps. Because the hardest part of the building an Algo is really the logic part. So. The hardest part to start doing an algo is not really the programming, because nowadays there are many tools, some even free. We can link them in the description below. Uh, there are free tools that you can start to create your own algos without having to know anything about code. But the logic, it's always hard, because as human beings, we are used to think of things and to have them pre-digested. We are not used to think of, oh, OK, in order to get downstairs there, OK, what do I need to do? Mm. If you're a human being, uh, what would you think? OK, I need to stand up, then go the stairs, and down the stairs. But if you're programming a robot, you have to tell the robot, OK, you have to stand up. Then this is how you stand up. You have to move the legs in this part, position. Yeah, yeah. You have to start moving that way. You have to lift up the legs. You have to find the direction of the door, walk in that direction. If there are obstacles, you have to surround them, and all those things. So. The way we think of things, usually in bigger terms, like in big picture terms, or even a strategy when we have our checklist, uh, like the trading plan, the one page trading plan, or any other checklist type that you have for your strategies, uh, you put some points in which you pre assume some other steps or other in between parts that our mind, our human mind, fills in because we are lazy, lazy creatures, so we fill in the spaces. But for robots, if you don't tell the robot to do something, it will not do that. It cannot assume. We are not yet in the point in which robots can assume what you want them to do or something via context. You can approach to that, but it's pretty hard. So the main thing for those uh, for to start programming, it's to get uh, the logic down and to start thinking in logic in terms of robots. You can start doing this by using the free uh, EA builders and just start compiling them, testing on a demo account, and see if they do what you expect them to do or if they do something completely different. There are many times in which I created an EA and I thought that all the logic was well, but there was a critical thing missing because I forgot to put a, a and in a, in a statement. And instead of making this plus this, it was making this uh, and then the other part as a separate, separate thing instead of making them uh, together. And it can, like if you're trading and you're trusting in your life money, that could be a difference between having a robot that performs as you expect mm. or losing all your money in, in one day, which has happened uh, in the past. It was a demo account, but I lost a demo account in one day because the robot just went uh, crazy and started opening trades uh, without stop. But it's one of the things that you cannot expect to be perfect from the start. You gotta be able to kind of code something from scratch that you that might or might not work well, and then finding out how to kind of correct the mistakes you've made, or maybe they're not mistakes; they're things that you didn't think about first. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't mean mistakes. It's just like things you forgot or things you're not used to, and then you correct those over time, and that's what makes a good algo. I know for during assistant, it took us a while to kind of spot all the things that didn't work as we expected or as we yeah, wanted exactly. and kind of cut them out all, all by, yeah. The original development or the very first rules we, we set was relatively quick because we already had a strategy, yeah. we already knew what we wanted. But then once we placed it, it was like, oh, looks like this is missing. What if we yeah. add this or what if we test with this? So we started adding more things. Oh. There was no like main error in that yeah. thing. It's just that 
when you pass that to a robot that cannot do some discretionary filtering like the humans do, then you notice that, oh, my strategy doesn't really work if it just takes every single setup that looks like that. We need mm -hmm. to make the setup filter it in a different way. And then you start adding rules to the robot or adding other things that can make it uh, able, in some cases now with the auto trade version that we are testing, uh, there are some back tests in which we don't even have to put any human input into it. We just put the input, the settings that the back tests that are the best, and just let it run, not even use support and resistance areas. While in other pairs, there is still some hard part of human, uh, human touch to, to put there. But the main thing is uh, experimenting and using the technology to your advantage of that experiment, because I mean, before you had to put live money to experiment in the markets. In, in old times, if you wanted to test something in the market, you had to either download the whole things in paper and start doing manually, or you had to put live money in an account in order to check, uh, to put the orders in the live market. Right nowadays, you can uh, do all that from the comfort of your home in any computer, uh, basically in a matter of minutes. How do you do your back this? How do you go through that process? Because I feel like there's things that we could do wrong. We could like over optimize, like test everything, then optimize it for that part. But how do you make sure that like, you create something first from scratch, a robot? And how do you make sure that, like it works well in the market? Yes. Well, the first thing I do when testing a robot is I first check that my code doesn't have any big, big hole or any big, big thing. Then I check that the traits I know it should be doing, it is doing it as they are. So basically, first first thing in a backtest is to check for main errors, like for any visible errors, uh, like maybe I forgot to put a statement so the robot opens a trade every hour whenever it checks the market because market conditions are telling it to open a trade, but there is no limiting on how many trades it can open, right? Things like that, like any big, big mistakes. And then after you get to that point, then you are going to start now back testing for the strategies, for the stats. So you need to get high quality data. There are several sources of even free high quality data and there are some paid software that get you help you get that quality data faster or you can pay for high quality data in other sources. Once you get the high quality data, you have to run the process in well, it can be pretty complicated. It becomes pretty statistical. Uh, but you run the process and you start gathering your stats. Uh, you can think of this like if you're going to be a review with your mentor and you have your trading stats, you have your trading journal with just your trade, you have my FX book, all the stats. You want to gather all that information and you want to be able to be check that because you first need to know, okay, as I expected or as default, let's say with default settings, now the strategy is making these returns. It could be a not profitable strategy, it could be a losing strategy. But then you start analyzing and see like, oh, if we eliminated every single Friday trade, uh, because Fridays are not good for this strategy, then we will, we will have a profitable strategy. Or, or, for example, something we did in the past experiment, what happens if we only trade during the London session because Let's say we have a day trading system that only trades during the day and the London session moves the markets more. Let's, let's just filter by that. And then you can see like, oh, if we only traded during the London session, then we will have had 10% profit per year instead of a loss of 2% per year in the past uh, several years. But the key is to have good quality data. And then uh, I would say that the next step is having a good amount of, of trades, having a good amount of numbers. The same as for a trader, if you are going to review their stats uh, for, like for a client, for example, uh, for a coaching client, you ask them to have at least as minimum, absolute minimum 30 trades, but ideally 100 trades so we can see the patterns. Uh, for back testing, I would even go farther to say, if you are trading, for example, a position trading system or something like that, then yeah, think 30 trades could be okay, but ideally you want to see at least 100 trades. If you can more, 300, 400 trades, because you have the benefit of time. You can back test the past 10 years of data with, a back, with that, and then you don't have to be like stuck there waiting for six months for a trade to happen, right? Yeah. Uh, so 100 trades at minimum, so you can do this, check the statistics, and then just check the statistics as if you were evaluating your own trading. That, that's the easiest way to make the, the comparison. Do you put a statistics like you used to do before in the, in, inside of my Facebook, like on the portal where you can look at the, uh, the results? Yes, I still do that, but I am doing less and less because I have created my own statistics. Okay. Uh, with time, uh, I have developed and found, okay, I don't care about this 
these stats, I do care about these stats, or, and I created my own stat, which is a pretty simple stat. Basically look at the profit and then divide that profit over the maximum drawdown. And then what I am looking for in my strategies is to have the best risk versus reward relationship. So I want to have the largest profit possible with the least amount of losses in the back-tested period. And it is really useful, especially when you are starting to test as a system, to use my FX book. There is a section which is called, I think it's a strategy. Yeah, strategy. And you just go there, log in, and you can upload your MT4 back test results. And it will basically do the same analysis as if you had an FX book account. The only uh, limitation is that it can only do it for one pair at uh, a time. Oh, and one time frame. So you can only do one test and then you can see it all get in isolation and then you need to use other tools to see them in portfolio. And since what I am doing right now is seeing everything as a portfolio, I develop a couple of stats and a couple of things that I look for to filter the trades, first, well, the strategies in that instrument first and then to see how they will fit, uh, not like a single strategy, but has how they complement my portfolio of other pairs. It could be the same strategy, just uh, instead of having it in the Euro USD and now I'm testing in the uh, Euro Aussie, for example, or, or something like that. So it's not necessarily adding more strategies, but adding more pairs. But everything I see it as, if I'm managing a portfolio uh, on each pair, each strategy, it's uh, an individual employee that is working together uh, to make that, that work. Yeah, and that reminds me of the course I recorded with Michael Tama a few weeks back, uh, several weeks back, in Florida. So about understanding, like, it's one thing to be to be training with algos and everything around, but you got to be able to understand how to scale up some employees, uh, maybe lay off some employees, which are your strategies, and how to kind of combine everything in a proper manner to be able to scale up. So that, that's really important. So that's just a parallel to what you're talking about. Yeah, and actually I have a plan in terms of, it's very similar to Michael's uh, gradation plan for trading, but I have a plan like that for my robots. I created some other robots which are, which I call them my risk managers. They are robots which their work is to uh, check the other strategies and manage the risk of these strategies. So they basically are notification systems in which if X strategy or X robot is taking too much risk, it will notify me so I can check if it's normal market conditions, just something happening, or if there is something bad happening with the robot or something like that. Or also if there are certain thresholds of losses, let's say that I know my robot should not have more than three losses in a row. It will check for that and it will let me know when that happens. And then I will basically have a sliding scale from full risk allocation to 0% risk allocation. And if the robot is underperforming consistently and is deviating from the back test, then it goes from the 100% up to 0% in terms of risk allocation. And then I start like that. And actually right now I have two robots that have lost their job. Uh, in my account. They lost their job since November and they have not been able to recover their job. They are still out there looking uh, for other other places uh, in terms of job. Uh, and I have other, the BBR robots, the main BBR robots, uh, they have gotten a, a pay raise, you can say like that. They had, they were originally at 75% uh, risk allocation, now they are at 100% allocation. Uh, because they have had better results. They are going with the back test and they are gotten within the normality. When I talk about normality here, I'm talking about uh, like statistical normality. So they are going within what is normal for the strategy to go. And I basically gave them a rise in terms of risk to those ones and I laid off the others. I still monitor them to see if one day they come back again, yeah. uh, but they are right now not, not trading any money at all. Yeah, like, like an employee. You just, yeah, if they're not performing, yeah, you like them up. Yeah, yeah. But I really like this model of having, having algos to monitor the risk, which is something I don't have yet, but I might want to work on that soon. That's been interesting. I like that. So one thing I learned myself from algos recently, since also working with you in the past, is that you cannot treat algo the same way when you trade news as opposed to manual trading. Like manual trading, you can trade news, I, I feel. You can place trades whenever you want, but the algo might take trades when you don't really want to take trades. So for the first few months for me, I was like, I said like before manually, I said, well, news don't matter. It's fine. I can just like leave it running. It should take trades. And then I realized like in theory, that's good because like it looks well, it looks good on the chart until you get to where your trades triggered entered and you're going to be far from your entry or far from where you're supposed to get in or get out in the market. So I stopped trading in the news and I think that's something you do as well. Yeah, that is uh, a thing in which I have conflicted uh, emotions in that, in that sense internally yeah. also because 
I back tested all my algos with news included, and they include some slippage um, because I'm using a software that allows you to simulate live market mm -hmm. uh, events. But currently, I trade an account for a prop firm, I trade an account for a client, and I trade my own account. So, three or four different brokers and three different. Yeah, no, four different price feeds and four different market conditions, right? All, in theory, all of them should be equally similar. But in recent news events, I have had trades in which uh, I have not yet had, I am, have been fortunate to not have yet been slipped negatively, so in just stop loss. But in the take profit, uh, with one, the take profits tipped uh, 15 pips. So I won 15 pips more. With the other broker for the prop firm account, uh, the broker closed the trade at the, start, at, the, at the take profit level without any extra win. For the client, it stopped at 10 pips. So the client got 10 pips more than what we expected. On my personal account, uh, the broker closed it also 15 pips. So different brokers, different liquidity providers affect the market differently. And you cannot backtest that reliably because unless you are trading that provider data feed and you can put like the amount of size you are doing all that, you cannot really know how much is going to be the real sleep that you get. And that may be a significant part of your PL. That may transform a strategy that is good to a mediocre one that you may not want to trade. So I have conflicted feelings because my backtest says that the strategy is good including those periods. So I should trade it, including those periods. But due to those market conditions, I am trying to avoid more and more those periods because I know that the market conditions are deviating from my backtest. So it's not fair presentation anymore. So I'm not uh, that happy to have those. But I still leave the accounts on during those news. There are some news only in which I will reduce the risk or prevent new trades from opening. But if they are trades already open, I will leave them. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, one thing that I started doing recently is holiday breaks. Uh, I, I close uh, my algos as of yesterday from the day of recording of this video and basically give them a holiday break because I know the markets are not the best in this time of the year. Already this month, my profit is higher than average for the month of December from the past 10 years of backtest. So I am pretty happy with that and I'm just going to get a break. Why? Because the probabilities now is that the other part of the month is not going to be that good. Yeah. So if I traded the whole month, it's likely that my results will become average to the other months in the backtest, uh, which will be basically 5% less performance for me and my clients, which uh, I don't want to have that. I want to, <laughs> to have good performance and also manage the risk because it's holidays, you may be out, you may be with friends, things like that. You don't want to be worrying yeah, about a trade. A new trade yeah, exactly. You don't want to be worried about a trade in, in New Year's Eve or in the, the Christmas party with family or any other holiday you, you celebrate. I also thought about closing my algo on the 20th of December, like this weekend. So after this week is over, I'm going to turn on the algo for the holidays and get, get back to the after for sure. So as I said, the results have been good for me also the beginning of the month, so it's pretty good. I think the example you gave was for the uh, election in the UK, right? Uh, no, there was something with the New Zealand dollar. I think it was a New Zealand dollar interest rate decision, something like that, a couple of months ago. Oh, okay. I remember you got slippage. Uh, yeah, I got slippage, slippage in that yeah. one, but I got yeah. positive one because yeah. I was in a different trade, different instrument, uh, but same one of the pairs. So what I've done for the UK election, which was like last week, is that I turned off the algo for all the GBP pairs, and looking after like in retrospect, it looks like super good. The charts are like yeah. they have the pattern. But if you were there, I'm sure, I'm confident that you, you wouldn't be able to take trade properly. There was one trade I took in that week, this week in, well, okay. when during the UK elections week, that week uh, was UVP New Zealand dollar. And I took it only because in my price action training, that structure looked, looked beautiful, looked okay. perfect structure. Uh -huh. And I got a notification from the trading assistant channel, which I use for my own trading. I use the pre-configured telegram channel we, we run. And I saw the structure and I was like, it's UEP, so it's higher risk. So it has to be looking really damn sexy for me to take it because it has to compensate me for that extra event risk. And it looked so good for me that I was thinking, unless there is something really, really drastic, this will not fulfill. And even if it, that happens, I actually reduce the risk. Instead of giving a full risk allocation, I gave it a quarter of a risk. So 0.25% okay. uh, of those trades. Uh, in risk instead of the 1% that I was using for the other pairs. Uh, because I was like, it still looks great, 
but I don't want to have the full risk uh, of this. Mm -hmm. But I let pass, there were like other five opportunities yeah. in GP related trades. None of them I took because I already had one GP pair, which is high risk for that. For that. And then the others didn't look as, as good as, as that one. Yeah. So, that, so that's an exception that I do, uh, but they have to look really, really good if they are outside of my back-tested uh, set. Mm -hmm. And how do you deal with the correlation between pairs? Do you kind of close trades when they are correlated, or do you just leave them all go and all take by the algo? Yeah, so for the pairs that I have back-tested in a portfolio, I let them run because I know that due to the back-test in the portfolio, even if they are correlated, I know how they have performed in the past 10 years. So in the past 10 years, they have not been an increase uh, in the risk, then I will allow it. Uh, how I measure it is that I usually want, when I add a new instrument or new pair to my strategy, to my portfolio, I want it to be increasing the profits and decreasing the risk of the portfolio. So using that diversification that, you know, Many people talk in the market, stock markets, like diversify your portfolio. It also works the same in your algos. So the ideal scenario is that I add something, it decreases my maximum drawdown, but it increases my, my expected profits. Most likely it will just stay the same maximum drawdown, but increase the profits. And I noticed that even adding similar correlated ones, uh, because they are using slightly different filtering, we have currently like five different ways of filtering the Bollinger Band, uh, the engulfing bars. Uh, so they are slightly different. So they may avoid one that was the same as the other pair. So now they are not taking the same trades uh, in that sense. And then the other part I do is for the pairs that I have not tested, I have a limit of maximum two trades uh, in the same um, main instrument or like the same like in related instruments, like if you have a pair and any of those two, I have another open and I have a maximum of two. And I will probably, if I see them together at the same time and they both look with, with opportunities, I will probably put half risk in one and half risk in the other one. So it's still like one full trade, but it's separated in, in two of them. Uh, so it's kind of like, um, I acknowledge it's higher risk, so I demand them to be better in terms of quality. I think that's it. Uh, what I suggest, if you have any questions for this video or for what to talk about or something else, comment with your questions, comment in the comment section. I know we'll be getting back to you on that uh, comment section. If you want to work with us as well, uh, we'll put a link below to apply. We have an awesome academy we've been working hard on. And I know people that follow the academy and get to the mastermind class and they get a lot of good results, which is awesome. So here, as always, are a few comments from the past video. Appreciate you guys for leaving comments below. And I'll catch you back here in the next video. Ciao.